जय राधा माधवा कुंज विहारी जय राधा कुंज विहाय गोपी जनवा गिरिवर हे जय गोपी जनवा गेरे वर हे गोपी गेरे सौरनंदन व्रज जन झसौरनंदन व्रज जन झमून थीरा है वान झमून थेरा है भान छा हे झमून थे झाई राधाम भाम कुंज बिहा रे हम कुंजिया गोपी जनवा गेरी भार धा रे है गोपी जनवा गेरे भाव धा रे गोपी जिसौर नंदन भज जन हंजनाय झसौर नंदन भज जन झमून थेरा भार छा झमून झमून थेरा भार छा झमून जय राधम भाम कुंज बिहा रे हे जय श्री श्री राध माधव हे जय राधम भाम कुंज बिहा रे जय जैया गोपी जनवा गेरे भर धारे गोपी हरे जैया गोपी जनवा गेरे भर धारे गेरे सौर नंदन भज जन हंजनायसौर नंदन भज जन हंजनाय 
झमुना थेरा हर हर चाहर झमुना थे झमुना थेरा हर हर चाहर झमुना थे हे झयरार हम मारवा गुंज बिहार है हे ध्यारार हम मारवा गुंज बिहार है गुंज और पेमलंदे शिव को भाग की जाए शिशिर राधा मारा वास्त साकी की जाए शिशि पंच तत्व की जाए श्रीमद् भागवतम कैंटो एट चैप्टर नाइनटीन द बोर्ड बेक्स चैरिटी फ्रॉम बाली महाराज एंड दिस इज वर्स नंबर फोर्टी वन गेटिंग टू द वेरी एंड ऑफ द चैप्टर पराग्रिकपूर्ण अक्षर यदमीति ब्रूयाचेत वायुम भिक्षवे सर्व ओं कौन नाल काम चात्मने पराग्रिकम पूर्व नक्षर यदमी यद किंचित ओमीति ब्रूयत तेन रिक्त वायुम भिक्षवे सर्व ओं कौन नाल खम चात्मने Ladies
Anyone else? Parak, that which separates. Rektam, that which makes one free from attachment. Apurnam, that which is insufficient. Va, either. Aksaram, this syllable. Yat, that. Tat, which. Om, omkara. Iti, thus stated. Yat, which. Kinchit, whatever. Om, this word om. Iti, thus. Bruyat, if you say, Tena, by such an utterance, Rikyeta, one becomes free. Vai, indeed. Puman, a person. Biksave, unto a beggar. Sarvam, everything. Omkorvan, giving charity by uttering the word om. Na, not. Alam, sufficiently. Kamena, for sense gratification. Cha, also. Atmane, for self-realization. So Sukharchari is instructing his disciple, Bali Maharaj, when uh, Vamanadev, in the form of a Brahmin boy, comes and begs charity. And here he understands that this boy is not just an ordinary boy, he's going to take everything away, so therefore he's making a plan so Bali doesn't lose everything. <laughs> Translation. The utterance of the word Om signifies separation from one's monetary assets. In other words, by uttering this word, one becomes free from attachment to money because this money is taken away from him. To be without money is not very satisfactory, for in that position one cannot fulfill one's desires. In other words, by using the word Om, one becomes poverty-stricken especially when one gives charity to a poor man or beggar. One remains unfulfilled in self-realization and in sense gratification. Hmm. This is a little difficult to understand, but it requires some discussion here. Purport. Maharaj Bali wanted to give everything to Vamanadev, who had appeared as a beggar. <laughs> But Sukaracharya, being Bali Maharaj's familial, familial spiritual master in the line of seminal succession, could not appreciate Bali Maharaj's promise. <clears throat> Sukaracharya gave evidence, Vedic evidence, that one should not give everything <clears throat> to a poor man. Rather, when a poor man comes to charity, one should untruthfully say, whatever I have, I have given you. I have no more. It is not that one should get everything, give everything to him. Actually, the word om is meant for om tat sat, the absolute truth. Omkara is meant for freedom from all attachment to money because money should be spent for the purpose of the supreme. The tendency of modern civilization is to give money and charity to the poor. Such charity has no spiritual value because we actually see that although there are so many hospitals and foundations and institutions for the poor, according to the three modes of material nature, a class of poor men is always destined to continue. Even though there are so many charitable institutions, poverty has not been driven from human society. Therefore, it is recommended here, Bhiksave Sarvam Om Kurvan Alam Kamena Chatmane. One should not give everything to the beggars among the poor. The best solution is that of, of the Krishna conscious movement. This movement is always kind to the poor, not only because it feeds them, but because 
but also because it gives them enlightenment by teaching them how to become Krishna conscious. We are therefore opening hundreds and thousands of centers for those who are poor, both in money and in knowledge, to enlighten them in Krishna consciousness. And therefore, the character, their character by teaching them how to avoid illicit sex, intoxication, meat-eating, and gambling, which are the most sinful activities and which cause people to suffer life after life. The best way to use money is to open such a center where all may come live and reform their character. They may live very comfortably without denial of any of the body necessities, but they live under spirit contr spiritual control and thus they live happily and save time for advancement in Krishna consciousness. If one has money, it should not be squandered away on nothing. It should be used to push forward the Krishna conscious movement so that all of human society will become happy, prosperous, prosperous and hopeful of being promoted back home, back to Godhead. The Vedic mantra in this regard reads as follows, and then there's this mantra from the Shrutis, Paragva itam ritam aksararayam itam om iti tat yat kinchet om iti ahantrarai vasmai tat rikchate sayat saram om kurvam richam atmanam sam kamay nalam shat so that it doesn't give a translation for that. <laughs> but we assume it consummates the whole point that's being made here. <laughs> that Omagyan timiranda syangana jana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shi guruvena maha nama om vishnu padaya krishna pristaya bhutale shi makti bhakti vedanta swami iti namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya Deisatarine Vanchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhupe Bhacha Patitanam Pavade Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasiddhi Gaur Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> how to uh, deal with a situation where one is being approached for some contribution. So, of course, it is just natural that people will give something. But here one says one should not give everything. <laughs> and by chanting the word Om, one becomes detached from everything. But when there is a class of people, especially in the uh, Indian society and also throughout Asia, and now it's also become spread in Western countries too, who live simply by begging. And, um, and then many times they approach devotees and others for contributions, and many times we give something. But then again, we don't know where the money is going to be used, because right here, Prabhupada says, um, it's, uh, it makes one point that uh, we can see that there, although, the, although there's so many poor people, the poor people will continue. And we can see that uh, the tendency of money to give money, such charity has no spiritual value because we actually see that there are so many, many hospitals and foundations for the poor. When Prabhupada came from India, he had a conception that the West was quite luxurious and everyone was well-to-do. But then when he came, of course, he came to New York City in the Bowery he saw that there were many persons, they were called derelicts or homeless and various other derogatory statements given to describe these people. <laughs> um, and he could see, oh yes, even here in these very uh, opulent countries there is a class of people 
as he said, they lie down on the footpath. <laughs> In other words, wherever you go, the three modes of material nature are there, especially in Kali Yuga, the lower motors are more prominent. And so, there's a story, of course, in the Christian tradition, that one, one uh, very uh, wealthy man, or actually, no, it was, uh, it was, who was it again? It was Mary Magdalene. She was giving some very fragrant oil, which was quite expensive to Lord Christ. And then, and she was criticized for making that donation. She, they said, why don't you use the money for feeding the poor? And Christ responded to them by saying, the poor will always be with you, but I will not be. <laughs> so what he was trying to say is that when gives to in the spiritual sense, that, benef that is actually beneficial for everyone. And so, Charity is by nature a principle of the heart because it says in the Shruti, not in the Shrutis, but in the in the uh, what is it? The Puranas, the Upa Puranas, the lesser Puranas. That there's three things you should always um, there's three things you should always do, and there's three things. What is it? Three things you should always there's three things you sh you can never get enough of, and there's three things you should be sa there's three things you should never be satisfied with, and there's three things you should always be satisfied with. The three things you should always be satisfied is with is food, money, and wife. Words <laughs> they come, and therefore one should be satisfied with that. And the three things you should never be satisfied is chanting the holy names of the Lord, hearing the glories of the Lord, Krishna Kata, and giving in charity. So this idea is mentioned that one should continue to give in charity. But what Prabhupada said, what is real charity? We have the example of Rupa Goswami when he retired from the government he had actually two boatloads of gold coins that he had amassed for, for his employment under the Islamic rule. And now he had all that wealth, but what did he do? He divided the wealth in half, and he gave half to the Krishna consciousness movement, and the other half he divided in half again, 50% for personal expenses and 50% for savings. <laughs> And Prabhupada said that is how money should be, you know, divided up like that. But who follows that? <laughs> who follows that? But when you give to something that is beneficial, such as furthering spiritual principles or spiritual activities in the world, then the, the benefit, the one who gives benefits, the one who receives benefits, and those who will receive in the future will also benefit. So it has a great amount of, uh, of value when we give to something that is spiritual. Of course, there are so many institutions and sometimes we also get asked by these institutions to give some charity in some different ways. Sometimes we see that there are uh, food programs going around the world in order to feed people. So sometimes devotees also give to that. And, but we don't give, you know, we try to support these movements not by supporting their principles, because we know the money actually never, doesn't even reach the people who they're actually propagating for, because it usually goes into the hands of the people who are running the organizations, and very little, if any, gets to the actual destination that is the so-called. So, therefore, everything today in charity is quite, what we say, flimsy or what we say, questionable, <laughs> precarious. <laughs> and just sometimes when you see. Now, there is, there's many angles from this idea of charity because Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, when he was traveling with his devotees, they were all grihastas. 
and um, some beggars had come to beg from the Grihastas. They were at one particular temple and beggars came and uh, they had refused them. Bhakti Siddhanta uh, noted that they had been refused and he um, kind of chastised his uh, followers by saying, you know, you, if you don't give, you'll become hard-hearted. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah, it was in a holy place also. So, yeah, and, and of course, people in the holy place, they also consider to be sadhus. So, <laughs> that's another reason to give. But he wanted to make that point that, uh, you know, so we see, I know when I travel in India, we always have a few coins or we carry some prasadam with us. Um, mostly we carry prasad. I know one temple, the Bombay temple, they have a rule, all their, all their drivers who drive the devotees in different places have to carry prasadam. Because every time we stop at some light or some reason for stopping, there's always people coming to the side and looking for something. And if you get if you don't give them some prasadam, you should give them at least one coin or something. Something has to be given like that. And here it says, you know, when they come and if they ask for more, you say, well, I, that's all I have. <laughs> so that untruth is actually considered to be good, <laughs> or not good, but recommended like that. But here we have Sukharcharya. What is his situation? He's um, he knows that if Bali uh, acquiesces to the request of uh, Bhamanadev, he'll be disenfranchised. He's a paid guru, you know, in other words, because Bali is so wealthy. He owns the three worlds, and he has everything, and Sukrachari is quite nicely situated, being his spiritual teacher. Uh, he's afraid that now he'll be, you know, disenfranchised, he'll be out. So he's speaking on, not only for Bali, but he's speaking for himself also. <laughs> That's the underlying theme, and that will be also mentioned. Uh, then if you go on to the rest of the verses, actually this verse requires m the rest of the verses to really give it a clear understanding, but at least Prabhupada gave kind of compacts it into the idea of the importance of charity really means to... Therefore, when Vamanadev comes, he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Giving money to the Supreme Lord is always beneficial, both for the giver and, and for the use of the money. The money gets its proper use because Lakshmi sits on the chest of Narayan. Therefore, when one uses Lakshmi in the service of Narayan, or to give donations to Narayan for whatever reason, Lakshmi actually benefits that uh, person. We have the example of the opposite. When uh, Ramchandra was here and Ravana so, what we say, evilly stole his wife, goddess of fortune, he was thinking that would give him greater happiness, but what it did, it caused him complete misfortune. He lost everything. Not only his wealth, his kingdom, and his life itself. Of course, you know, he was at, that was the actual concert of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the point Prabhupada makes in using this as an example is that when Lakshmi is used in the service of Narayan, then that is the proper use of Lakshmi, because that's where she belongs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we also use a little bit of our Lakshmi, or whatever Krishna gives us in our devotional service, to maintain our body, but that is also allowed. But anything beyond that, that will cause one to be develop a type of, what we say, attachment to something material. So one should live according to their means and use everything in devotional service. Because devotional service is actually the benefit of this, the living entity's existence. To enjoy this material world, and money is the form of enjoyment. 
and people who have money think, oh, wow, now I have achieved success in life. I have gotten everything. I can go where I want. I can do what I want. I can even control others. So many, and therefore you see who is glorified today in today's world, those who are very wealthy. But the Shastras say, I think it's Niti Shastra, that a rich man is popular in his own area, but a no person who has knowledge is popular all over the world. It's famous all over the world. So knowledge is a greater form of wealth than this material stuff called money. And nowadays, what is it? It's not even money anymore. It's paper. <laughs> Real wealth is actually, you know, gold, silver, uh, equity. Equity in the terms of if you have land, you're wealthy. If you have animals, you're wealthy. If you have food supplies, you're wealthy. If you have, you know, go, co coins, you're wealthy, or, you know, value precious metals, you're wealthy. And the earth is full of that. And the earth is full of wealth. All of these things are produced by the material nature itself. And so the living entities can live nicely and use this wealth in order to serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But now wealth has become a, f a more or less a fetish. It's more like people are chasing after wealth because material wealth works in such a way as you're never satisfied. You're never satisfied. You see, the people who are rich, they actually make it a game to get more and more and more. They don't need it. But it becomes a, a actually mental disease that the more they have, the more they want. And they work hard to get even more, although though they can live without it still. It becomes something, it's like conquering the, the principle of having more and more and more. It's a sickness, it's actually a disease like that. And uh, so this is the world today. And so who are glorified in the world today? Rich people, and that's Kali Yuga. People who have knowledge are not giving so much credit, and those who are engaged in spiritual life and those who have the uh, are elevated in spiritual life are seen as you when we say, uh, what's the word? Uh, parasites. parasites. Yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Parasites. They, they depend. Everyone else is supporting them, and. They're living for free. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Jis pancha tattva ki jai. But Srila Prabhupada would say, we are not living off anyone, we are living off our father, who is the wealthiest of all. Because everything is owned by the Lord, and those who serve the Lord, the Lord will take care of them very nicely. And the devotees don't have to worry about having anything because the Lord will take care of it automatically, if you gauge in devotional service. <laughs> with, but if you uh, are making, getting material things is the foundation for your success in devotional service, in other words, I have to have this or else I can't serve, then um, you may be struggling for a long time with this illusion, because service is always available. And there, we, as long as we are engaged in devotional service, that is the real wealth. Therefore, it talks about there's four kinds of wealth. The lowest form of wealth is this material wealth, which we know is money. Higher than that is knowledge. Higher than that is austerity. And higher than that is bhakti. <laughs> so bhakti is considered the greatest of all wealth because it actually attracts the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is Bhagavan, who is the source and owner of all wealth. <laughs> now that is real wealth, bhakti. That's the wealth of the heart, the wealth of the soul. But Sukracharya, he's, he knows the, the, the more or less the niti shastras or the, the shrutis that give various types of conditions under which one can act and he knows how to juggle these things in order to somehow or other keep his position 
um, secure. And that's why he's speaking like that. And you'll, as you go into verses 42, and then the last verse is 43, you'll see how he talks about, um, what's the word? Um, an untruth. How do you use untruth? There are different ways, according to Shastras, where untruth is allowed <laughs> in order to accomplish something supposedly higher, <laughs> like that. But the devotee will always see whatever I have is actually the grace of the Lord. So Prabhupada said the best use of money is to open open a Krishna consciousness center like that. Or, well, that's one of the best ways to use it, or to facilitate the preaching programs by supporting various types of programs, such as Sankirtan, book distribution, prashadam distribution, and uh, various types of programs. This is the best use of money because that's what it's meant for. <laughs> when you use something that the item is meant to be used for, and that's the best use of that item. <laughs> but people, and nowadays people don't know how to use money. Sometimes we see a lot of people, they have so much wealth, and uh, or they even don't have a lot of wealth, but they never spend whatever they have. <laughs> they just keep it in the bank. Prabhupada says, then they go and look at their bank account and they feel good to see the numbers, but they never spend it. <laughs> there was one person, he was, a, he was a billionaire, but he would drive a junky old car and walk around with overalls. That was his program, you know. <laughs> uh, he, uh, and uh, if you go to India, you see many of the beggars, they actually have a lot of money. <laughs> But they live very, because begging is a good business. And they, they get the external facade and then they have all this extra wealth on the side that they've been begging for years. <laughs> and then when they get old, then they can retire from the begging business <laughs> and live nicely. <laughs> That's their plan. Prabhupada talks about that also. <laughs> so you see, um, therefore, in the, uh, in the 11th canto, there is 15, uh, what we say, uh, what is the word? Anarthas or defects uh, that money brings. Money brings envy, enmity, uh, uh, fault finding, lying, cheating. There is excess wealth like that. Uh, the 15, uh, what we say, bad qualities are mentioned with an uh, excess amount of wealth. So therefore you see the people who have a lot of money, they're never happy. They're never happy. They either want more or they're in anxiety to protect what they have so others will not take it. And so many guards and dogs and walls and bars and chains and so many ways to protect their money like that, but ultimately everything is taken away at the time of death. <laughs> There's a nice story where, uh, well, I don't know if it's a nice story. I'll tell it anyway, it's kind of short. There was one very rich merchant, he was very rich and greedy, and he had four wives. <laughs> and uh, then he goes to the the Kaviraj, and the Kaviraj says, well, my dear sir, you have a terminal disease, you have six months to live, there's no cure for it, make your plans. So he goes back, now he's in anxiety. He's wealthy, has all his money, has four wives, now he's going to die very soon. So he goes to his, his uh, fourth wife, which was his favorite wife, and his fourth wife was his favorite wife. And he says, my dear wife, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm going to die soon. Will you come with me? She says, Haribo, nice knowing you. 
see you around. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> We're finished. <laughs> so then he goes to his third wife. She's a little less devoted, but still very devoted to him. And uh, he asks her the same question. She said, um, well, actually, um, mm, well, um, when you die, I'm going to get remarried. <laughs> so that's it. I'm going to look for another husband. So don't ask me. <laughs> So he goes to the second one, second wife, not as devoted, but still so there's something there. And he uh, asks her the same question. She said, well, I'll come to the grave and see you off, but that's as far as I go. <laughs> and then now he's, he's embarrassed because he completely neglected his first wife. And now he's, that's the only one left, but he thinks maybe Maybe I'll get lucky. <laughs> so he goes to his first wife and asks her, and she says, I will never leave you. I'll always be with you. The one that was the most neglected of all the wives. So who were the four wives? The fourth wife is the body. And so when, you know, when time goes, that's gone. The third wife is our material possessions. So when... If we die, somebody else gets him remarried. <laughs> the second wife is our friends and relatives. They come to the grave to see us off, and that's it. And the first wife is the soul. <laughs> you, or actually, you might, might say Krishna. Uh, Krishna will never leave us. So that's the story of the materialists. They put God in the last position at best and everything else first. But God never leaves them, even if they have to go on to another situation. So I remember I was in Beverly Hills, California, which is one of the most <laughs> richest places in, in America. All these movie stars and other people who are involved in various types of, uh, you know, actresses and actors. So I was asked, I was, I, I'm, became friends with one devotee who was friends with one of the a real popular person out there. And that pro person got interested in Krishna consciousness. So he asked me to come and speak to all of these people. <laughs> and he was like, these are producers and people in, in Hollywood and others. So he was an author, so I came and I was thinking, what am I going to say to these people? <laughs> So I told that story. <laughs> I thought, let me go for the, you know, for the rhino. <laughs> so I told that story. And you know, they liked it. <laughs> they really liked it. After the end, I mean, maybe not everybody liked it, but most people did. <laughs> they actually come up to me and they start asking me, you know, you know, I'm not happy. I'm on my third wife. <laughs> And they were telling me all their problems. Somehow they I, they became sympathetic and they wanted to hear more. So I sat there the whole night just <laughs> listening to their problems, which was good, you know. Because actually, I think some of them actually started to become more serious in spiritual life. So yeah, um, this story is really a, like a landmark story. It tells you that like you, whatever you have, whatever... Uh, if you have Krishna, you actually have everything. If you have everything and you don't have Krishna, you have nothing. That's real poverty. <laughs> the poverty of the soul. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Any questions, comments? Do we have any from the, you know, cyberspace? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai.